HIV up till about a year ago when I got interested, of course, as an ID doctor in trying to shape the dialogue around COVID-19. So I'm going to review my career path and the history of the clinic that I direct here at UCSF because I'm the medical director of Ward 86. And then I'll talk about how work in HIV was really lends itself to working on the other second viral pandemic of our, um, you know, our day really, which is COVID-19, because these two are ongoing and they're both the viral pandemics of our day. And then I want to talk about harm reduction. Um, so personally, actually, I grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah, um, and that was challenging, actually. I was um, a, a person of color, and it was um, a pretty, um, it was not a very diverse state. Uh, it is more diverse now, and this both challenged me and motivated me, and um, I wanted to uh, I went to Harvard Medical School for um, medical school, but I actually made a beeline after that to San Francisco because what I was interested in was HIV research and HIV clinical care. And um, it was really the stigma that I saw in Utah, just sort of uh, being someone who uh, at the time, because it wasn't diverse, uh, being stigmatized for something I couldn't control, which was the color of my skin. Um, and that stigmatization really led me to be very interested in the intersection between stigma and infectious disease. What is it about just being who you are that can lead you being more likely to get an infectious disease like HIV? And so because um, uh, uh, San Francisco was the epicenter of the HIV um, epidemic in the United States, I was always interested in coming here and working on HIV here. So I do want to tell you a little bit about HIV when I talk about stigma and how it entered human populations and who it's still infecting um, to, to, to talk to you about the fact that it's still, a, as all infectious diseases are, it's a disease of disparities and it's a disease of stigma. Um, so if we think about the history of HIV, um, you know, just briefly to remind ourselves, uh, this is an infection that arose from a zoonotic transmission. It arose from uh, the fact that there are what are called simian immunodeficiency viruses that look very much like HIV in all of our uh, primate relatives. And it's when one SIV strain jumps into a non, um, into a primate that is not supposed to be in like humans, that that human can get sick or that primate can get sick. And so the, uh, the, or the origination of this retrovirus of HIV was really um, jumped from primate into humans. And the question is, when did that happen? And where did that happen? And how did that happen? And um, to remember uh, how it happened and where and when, we just had to drill down a little bit and remind ourselves that there are two major types of HIV around the world. There's HIV-1 and there's HIV-2. And HIV-1 has uh, a couple of different groups. That's actually the majority of infections are HIV-1. And 90% of HIV-1 infections are what are called group M. And that is most closely related to the SIV strain in, in the chimpanzee. And then there are um, HIV-2 strains that originated from an SIV strain that was actually originally in the Sudi Mangabe. And when and where and how did this enter human populations has been a really interesting story. Um, the first theory on this was actually propounded by a journalist named Edward Hooper, who thought, um, who's actually been researching how HIV entered human populations for uh, uh, more than 30 years now. And he wrote this book in 1999 called The River. And his idea at the time was that the, the way HIV entered um, human populations was through, through mass polio vaccination campaigns because there was three polio vaccines at the time. There was Salk, who was the inactivated, uh, had developed the inactivated shot vaccine. There was Sabin, who had uh, developed the oral polio vaccine. But there was another scientist named Hilary Krakowski who had developed an inactivated polio vaccine. And in 1957, the NIH convened a committee and they said, you know, Kaprowski, your vaccination isn't as good as the salt vaccine. So um, the world should go with the salt vaccine. But Kaprowski, who had ties to the Belgium, uh, to Belgium, um, who at the time was colonizing regions like the Belgium controlled Africa, essentially like the Democratic Republic of Congo, went ahead and mass vaccinated very large regions in Belgium controlled Africa in the 60s. 
And uh, the theory that propounded in this book was that it was that mass vaccination campaign that led to the introduction of a primate SIV strain into humans. And even though that wasn't the source, um, uh, and actually this vaccine was grown in, um, in African green uh, uh, monkey kidney cells. So that was the idea that, you, that it was grown in, in, kidney, in um, primate cells. And even though this wasn't the real reason, it did lead to greater vaccine safety uh, for vaccines that were made in animal cells. Um, but the real crossover event and the way that HIV entered human populations was likely the bushmeat trade. And the bushmeat trade is the practice of hunting and killing um, uh, primates for food. And it was in West Africa that likely HIV entered human populations, actually hunters who are bushmeat trade, uh, trade hunters um, have a lot of simian immunodeficiency viruses in their chromosomes. In fact, their chromosomes have, are littered really with, with a lot of SIV strains. And then all it takes is for one, a person who has an SIV strain that's able to pass from human to human for that strain to take off in human populations. And that's what happened. And then it wasn't just the bushmeat trade, but it was actually the social disruption that was called, caused by colonialism in West Africa that really set the conditions for an active sex trade, set the conditions for um, multiple trade, uh, um, um, a massive increase in trade, and set the conditions for the spread of an infectious disease like HIV, which is sexually spread. So the next question is, well, when did it enter human populations? And, you know, it's actually, it's, it's, we are not exactly positive how when HIV entered human populations, because unlike, um, you know, what, what we can do now in the world to trace infectious diseases into humans, you actually needed a refrigerated specimen of blood or tissue to go back in time and say, was HIV there? And we didn't used to refrigerate a long time ago. And um, HIV is not stored, uh, it does not enter bones and, and hair, for example. So you needed actually blood or tissue specimens. So as far as we can tell, the first idea, um, because people did have some blood specimens stored from West Africa in the Democratic Republic of Congo from 1959, this was University of Washington, and they had been gathering plasma specimens for a malaria project in Kinshasa in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And they went, they had these plasma specimens in their freezer from 1959, and they went back and they sequenced all of them and they found that one of those blood specimens had HIV. So they calculated, this, this paper was published in, two, in the year 2000, they calculated that HIV probably entered human populations in the year 2000, uh, sorry, in the year 1930. Um, and then, Later, another tissue specimen was found um, from the Democratic Republic of Congo. This is from a woman who had died of lymphoma and that had HIV in it as well. And so doing calculations, and this paper was published in 2008, from what HIV looked like now, from what the original simian immunodeficiency virus looked like in, chim in chimpanzees, the current estimates of when HIV came into human populations was actually around the turn of the 20th century, um, it reached somewhere between 1884 and 1924. Um, and that's, that's what we currently think is when HIV came into human beings. And then, as I told you, it's really the social disruption in West Africa that resulted from colonialism that set the conditions for a low level infection in a population that was going on from 1908 onward um, it was really in the second half of the 20th century when cities became large enough, when sex trades were established, when these large, uh, a lot of migration was occurring that set the conditions for a sexually transmitted infection like HIV to spread. And probably it was Kinshasa growing in size, other um, cities growing in size from colonialism in West Africa that led fundamentally to this rapid spread of HIV so that by the 70s, um, HIV was really happening in West Africa. And then what did it have to do? It had to spread to other areas where susceptibility could occur. From West Africa, when it went to East Africa, the conditions were even more set up for HIV to spread. There was low status of women. There was a lot of labor migration, a lot of truck driving, a lot of people going here and there, um, uh, a large sex trade. And by 1986, 
85% of sex workers in Nairobi were infected with HIV. And then it uh, transferred down from West Africa, uh, East Africa to Sub-Saharan Africa and down the Thames and Road, uh, down into um, areas of South Africa uh, and Zambia, and really the spread occurred in Sub-Saharan Africa after that. And so this is what the map looked like in 1985 of HIV infection. You can see that it was really restricted in high levels with the dark areas to West coming over to East Africa. And then here's our map by 1995, 10 years later, that this really was an infection that had gone over to East Africa and down to South Africa. Um, and now here's our map in 2005 with the breakdown of the former Soviet Union. There were conditions that were set up there for massive spread. And then here is where we are as of the end of the year 2019. It's important to remember that we still have 38 million people living with HIV in this world, more than any other time in history. And we have had 77.3 million people infected with HIV since the beginning of the pandemic. It is still spreading in areas uh, of vulnerability. Um, there are areas still in Sub-Saharan Africa where the rates are increasing in very vulnerable populations like young women and adolescent girls uh, who are more vulnerable in Sub-Saharan Africa to not being able to protect themselves from uh, sexually transmitted infections. And HIV incidence is still increasing in 50 countries. And the COVID pandemic has actually set back a lot of our HIV prevention efforts. Only 26 million of those 38 million people, when we talk about vaccines with COVID, we should remember that we've had life-saving antiretroviral therapy for HIV since 1996. And still 12 million people are left out of the equation um, uh, uh, and do not have access to life-saving antiretroviral therapy in the year 2021. And uh, still 1.7 million newly infected people every year. So uh, we are certainly not through this pandemic. Um, and, uh, and I hope to go back to this pandemic as do many ID doctors um, as soon as COVID is over. To give you a reminder of what happened here in the United States, it was 1981 that the first clinical descriptions of HIV came about. And this was uh, in the MMWR uh, by the CDC, these descriptions of these terrible infections that were occurring in mainly young gay men in Miami and Philadelphia and New York and San Francisco and LA. And uh, these terrible infections that we had not seen except in profoundly immunocompromised people prior to this, like pneumocystis and Kaposi sarcoma and cytomegalovirus. And um, San Francisco was really at the heart of that. Uh, San Francisco in the early 80s was really the epicenter of the epidemic in the United States of HIV. These are pictures that the San Francisco Chronicle called 1984, the year of the plague here in uh, San Francisco from HIV. And this is a look at men um, fighting, uh, 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 actually protesting in front of our federal building in San Francisco fighting for our lives as they were trying to work with the NIH with advocates and trying to expand uh, research into HIV. This was before the president of the country at the time had even mentioned the word HIV, despite uh, this being a massive infection um, within young men. Uh, by 1991, uh, uh, sorry, by 1982, um, luckily the, the infection had been relabeled from gay-related immunodeficiency virus to AIDS-acquired immunodeficiency virus by the CDC. In 1983 was the first time that a gay couple appeared on the cover of a major magazine, which is Newsweek. This is Bobby Campbell, an AIDS activist with his partner, Bobby Hilliard. And in 1983, the antibody test for HIV was developed. Uh, 1983 was the year that the clinic that I am uh, privileged to serve as medical director of here at San Francisco General Hospital uh, opened its doors. So it is the oldest HIV clinic in the country. In 1984, Bobby Campbell died of AIDS. And in 1984, bathhouses in San Francisco were closed, followed by those in New York in an attempt to quell the pandemic in these two cities. In 1985 was actually the time that the first commercial ELISA was approved two years after we knew how to diagnose uh, uh, um, HIV, which is another story about why it took so long. These are the kind of uh, covers that were going on in the 80s. Um, you know, one cover of Discover Magazine saying, this is not an infection of heterosexuals, this is the price 
uh, uh, that people have to pay for the fatal price that one can pay for anal intercourse in Discover Magazine um, on 1985. Then Life Magazine the same year was saying no one is safe from HIV and showing a heterosexual couple. Um, 1985 was the year that Rock Hudson came out and said um, that he had uh, HIV and he died later that year of AIDS. Uh, a major a human actor. And 1985 was also the year that a young boy in uh, Indiana named Ryan White was banned from going into a school because he was a hemophiliac and he had acquired HIV from blood transfusions and parents uh, literally lined up and prevented this young boy from going into school saying that it would threaten their children. Um, and he died uh, eight years later from uh, complications of HIV. Uh, uh, this is the uh, in 1987, you can see the NAMES project was formed here in San Francisco, which was the idea that for every person who had died of HIV, that there would be a large quilt made with each quilt panel serving as a memorial to those who had died of uh, AIDS in this country. And here you can see in 1987 that the AIDS quilt was poured out over the Washington Mall um, and it covered the entire Washington Mall showing how many deaths we had uh, by 1987 of HIV in this country. And then this is the first map of Ward 86. This is actually the same clinic that we have as of today, two floors from where I'm sitting now. Um, and, uh, and we tried to start a clinic here at Ward 86 that was comprehensive in our services. We didn't want people to go here and there and there for medical services. We wanted it all in one place. Oncology, social work, psychiatry, neurology, everything all in one place. Uh, we call this the San Francisco model of care. And, nine, and Ward 86 stays that way today. In 1990, I had told you about this young boy who got HIV uh, named Ryan White from hemophilia, and he died at the age of 18. And later that year, there was a bipartisan act that has continued from Congress called the Ryan White Care Act. And that act is to fund low-income clinics like ours here at Ward 86 to provide wraparound models of care and services for our low-income patients living with HIV in this country. By 1992, AIDS was the leading cause of death among US men, ages 22 to 44. And 1995 was when um, we had reached over 500,000 AIDS cases here in the US. In 2010, Obama started the National HIV AIDS Strategy. And in 2019, a new um, program was started called End the HIV Epidemic. Uh, and the idea there is to try to use all the tools we have now and end the HIV epidemic. This is the current state of the pandemic in the United States. You can see these dark areas of very high rates of infection are really, though we have it in, the, in California and the Northeast are starting to cluster in the South and the Southeast of this country because this is places where a lot more heterosexual spread is occurring and a lot more infections are occurring out of poverty and incarceration and discrimination and disparities. And the key demographics of the new HIV diagnoses in this country are really rising among um, black and brown populations. Uh, blacks make up 44% of new HIV diagnoses in 2016, even though they're only 12% of the population. So it's a familiar story that disparities are rampant when you think about the impact of infectious diseases. Um, I'm actually going to uh, skip ahead and talk a little bit about um, COVID. Uh, I, uh, uh, as an infectious disease doctor, I became interested in, of course, researching COVID as soon as it came out. And I started re um, doing research on face masks for the prevention of COVID-19 transmission. And now I'm interested in working on vaccines and vaccine optimism and, and messaging about COVID-19 vaccines and how impressive they are. However, I think that one thing that may have been lost from some of our dialogue in this country around COVID-19 mitigation is this idea that we learned from HIV to begin with, which is harm reduction principles, that you don't tell people uh, abstinence only, you don't tell people that stay away from each other completely, but instead you acknowledge that there are risks that are people gonna take because they have to be out in the world um, uh, working or they need to see other human beings because they're lonely. And how do you work with harm reduction principles to say, let's keep our masks, distancing, ventilation, but we can still 
We don't have to be completely abstinence from human contact. And unfortunately, I think that was lost a lot from our dialogue here in the United States about messaging um, using harm reduction principles from HIV. And I've been really interested in studying that and in writing about that and essentially acknowledging the holistic experiences of individuals within the context of an infectious disease pandemic like HIV, like COVID-19, beyond just the pathogen. Harm reduction when applied to disease prevention for infectious disease is the principle of advising people how to mitigate risk while acknowledging the real world conditions that may lead individuals to take some risks, including essential work, um, including uh, failure, uh, we need to provide sick leave, we need to support um, uh, uh, workers during closures, and we need to acknowledge loneliness and our desire to be around other human beings. So what we've been working on is chiseled lockdowns instead of blunt lockdowns, encouraging outdoor activities instead of indoor activities during high rates of COVID-19 transmission, outdoor dining, not indoor dining, um, uh, 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 still keeping places like schools open, but with reduced capacity, masks, distancing, ventilation. Harm reduction is the idea that um, we're going to be living with this pathogen for a while and also having more compassionate messaging. And it's been something that we've been really interested in in our group. You don't tell people to wear a mask in a um, unkind manner. You, you message kindly about face masking and its importance. Um, and I'm actually going to end there to see if we can do our questions, but I wanted to just give you that kind of arc of history from HIV into COVID-19 and what I'm interested in, and I'd love to hear from you, and I'm happy to answer any questions or talk about any way that I can um, encourage this group around uh, infectious disease and um, why people, why, <laughs> why I'm so interested in infectious disease and why I actually think it's the best field in the world. Thank you, Dr. Gandhi, for that extremely informative presentation on HIV and COVID-19. Um, I thought it was particularly interesting that you connected what you learned um, from HIV to harm reduction in COVID-19. Um, for the next part of this event, um, we would love to hear about your educational journey. Um, specifically, I know that you mentioned in your presentation that you were er um, interested in HIV early on and um, particularly the stigma that was associated with it. Um, but when did you first figure out that you wanted to go into epidemiology? You know, um, so I, uh, along with many of my Indian uh, counterparts, was encouraged to go to medical school by my parents. Um, I actually was more interested, to be honest, in, in politics. I was interested in um, racial and I was interested in disparities between rich and poor. I grew up uh, going to India, um, meaning I would go to India in the summers with my family. And I became very interested in disparities between rich and poor and working on fundamentally addressing those disparities. Then I was encouraged to go to medical school by my parents and I did. Um, and in the context of medical school, for me at least, what the field, that seemed most connected to disparities, the field that seemed most social, social justice minded was infectious disease. Because as I just, we just went over, you know, there are definitely disparities in cardiovascular disease, in, in heart disease. I mean, certainly disparities exist across um, poverty lines in every disease, but I don't think there's anything that illustrates that with such stark relief than infectious diseases. If we look at the history of COVID-19 in this country, who got most battered by both infections and also importantly by the economic restrictions, it was black and brown communities. And, um, and uh, uh, so infectious disease became quickly for me, a way to almost work on social justice in the context of medicine. And that's why, if, I mean, I'm always like, you guys should stay in touch with me. Anyone who ends up wanting to talk about this personally, you have my email. Like, I think this is the field that to me made the most sense about what I was interested in um, politically. Now, um, building off of that, I know you mentioned in your presentation as well as um, the answer to the previous question that you are a woman of color. Um, has that in any way affected how the people you work with treat you, whether that be your colleagues or other patients? 
Yes. So, I mean, um, it was very interesting for me because I grew up uh, in a place where being Indian actually was very rare. Um, and any anyone who was Asian was very rare. So um, in my elementary and middle school, there were uh, three Indians, which were myself, my sister, and my brother. Um, and then uh, there were two, eight, literally two people from East Asia, one who had been um, uh, uh, adopted as a child and adopted into a Mormon family. So we really had very little diversity in my school. And uh, I was definitely treated differently um, growing up. And then I went to, and then my parents, um, because they'd gone through partition in India, they were pretty insistent that we stayed uh, at home for undergraduates. So I actually went to the University of Utah and had to live at home, which I did not love. Um, but uh, uh, so I stayed there, you know, all throughout undergraduate. And then I went to medical school at Harvard and I was suddenly an Indian American medical student at Harvard, which is not a rare thing at all. And it was very strange to go from being in such a minority position to uh, not experiencing that feeling of being that different. And it was an, an incredible, I felt like I saw what it was like to always be judged constantly by the color of my skin for um, for the first 21 years of my life. And then and then almost like I crossed over into a divide and that wasn't happening um, uh, as much clearly in medical school. And then even when I came to San Francisco, but there are subtle, um, there is subtle stigmatization, discrimination. We are in a period of time where anti-Asian sentiment is high. Um, and uh, it will always be a part of my journey. It will always be a part of my life and it will always be a part of how I'm treated as a doctor. Um, like being, going into a room and having the patient speak to the tall white man medical student um, instead of looking at me as the attending um, as a short Indian woman. So yeah, it's part of, it's going to be part of, it, it will always be a part of my experience in the United States. It's very unfortunate to hear, especially in this um, time and age that we're living in. Um, so moving on, one of the many titles that you hold, which um, you also mentioned in your presentation, was the Associate Division Chief of the Division of HIV, Infectious Diseases, and Global Medicine at UCSF and um, SFGH. Um, what do those roles consist of on a daily basis? Um, yes, that's a great question. So I, um, you know, I, uh, I'm really, even though I do a lot of research, uh, we have a very large division and we have a division chief who's wonderful. And then she has put two associate division chiefs into play um, who work on different aspects. And I'm in charge of clinical operations and education. So what that means the associate division chief of that of that domain is that I help organize the clinical schedules for everyone, and I decide who's at um, who gets time in our HIV clinic and who gets time in our inpatient infectious disease ward, and how to arrange that schedule. And then I also work with a lot with education, which is ranging at least at our university because we're only a medical university. We're not we don't have an undergraduate program at UCSF. UCSF is a um, is solely a health systems, health training, um, graduate and medical school program. So I work with medical students, residents and fellows, infectious disease fellows, um, and help arrange their educational experiences here in the division, including rotating through our medical clinic, um, which, is, uh, which is the HIV clinic called Ward 86. So it involves a lot of administrative responsibility, but I actually have to say, it is really the most satisfying thing I do is working with early stage trainees um, and I'm trying to instill this passion for infectious disease and nowhere is too young to start <laughs> to instill passion in infectious disease. And I actually think that COVID-19 um, is driving up our medical school admission processes. There was more people who applied to medical school last year. Um, it's also driving up rates of people applying for infectious disease fellowships. Um, a lot of interest in ID. Um, I know you mentioned that um, 
things that you the things that you do that are really satisfying in your job and um, building off of that what is the accomplishment in your career that you are most proud of you know um I think the thing that I'm most proud of is actually um being medical director of Ward 86 because I think it's really meaningful and I think that we innovate new models of care. And so what I mean by that is, for example, two years ago, we realized that, of course, people are doing better with HIV medications, but the people who are not doing better are people who don't have a home. And uh, in this city, we have a really terrible problem with homelessness in the city of San Francisco. Um, And so I think that, uh, so we started and we modeled something called um, the uh, pop-up clinic, which the pop-up clinic is a designated program for those who are marginally housed, where an appointment time does not mean anything when you're living in a tent or you're living in an encampment. Like four o'clock on Tuesday uh, does not make sense. And essentially our model of care in the pop-up program is that if you don't, if you're homeless, you can drop into Ward 86 anytime, anywhere, and we will see you, we will do your primary care, we will have a same designated team that comes around you, and we'll um, have you work with a social worker, a nurse, and a doctor to, on any of your medical needs. And the pop-up program is small, but it's been really mighty, and we've managed to um, increase what are called virologic suppression rates or people getting on therapy, staying on HIV therapy. And so it's sort of the entire idea is novel models of care. And so I think this is what I am most proud of is being medical director of Ward 86. Very, very um, inspirational what you do at Ward 86. Um, and final question in this category is, what is something that you wish you had done differently in your career? And what have you learned from this experience? You know, um, it's really interesting um, that, uh, is that infectious disease is really, like I was talking about before, is really political. And, um, And I have been speaking out about schools and of school openings in the United States because um, I think that uh, our prolonged closures of schools, especially here in California, where only 13% of uh, California children are back in full-time care, doesn't exactly go with um, the infection, some infectious disease doctor sentiment that everyone should just be completely closed down until until the COVID-19 pandemic is over. And this harm reduction mentality that I was talking to you about has not been met um, uh, with enthusiasm uh, always because it's actually assuming some risk. It's assuming that there may be some risk but that you can't stay completely shut down and that you um, have to keep settings open to maintain life, including teaching. And I have gotten, more flack for this than I ever thought I would. I have never been controversial before. I've been like, did everything I was supposed to do. And I have gotten into a lot of, uh, uh, frankly, like arguments because we're in such a politicized climate that right now, if you want to keep things open, you were like more on the side of Trump. And if you wanted to keep things closed, then you were doing all the right things politically to just keep things closed. And it was amazing how politicized the COVID-19 pandemic came in the United States. So for, I'll give you a good example. We were told to shut down our clinic um, on March 17th in the city of San Francisco. We were told to do all of our visits by telephone. We do not have patients that can do all of their visits by telephone. We have homeless patients. We have people who don't have phones. We have patients who don't have smartphones. They have like these kind of old uh, type of phones. Um, uh, and we do not... Uh, have that patient population. And we knew that if we maintained telemedicine, uh, we were gonna lose our patients. And so we, uh, we all put on masks, we all distanced from each other. We kept our windows open at our clinic upstairs um, and we kept on seeing our patients in person. And uh, none of us got COVID. Uh, uh, we kept ourselves safe and we kept our, our patients taken care of. We got a lot of flack. Uh, a lot of most other clinics were closing. They were doing telephone health. If you can't find your patients, you can't find.
behind them, they'll get over it. And, um, and we got into a lot of trouble. And because uh, I wasn't doing what people told me that I was supposed to do as the medical director of Ward 86. So do I regret it? I don't think I regret it, but I've never been in a position where I've been so in opposition to some of my peers. And it's been a really challenging time. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Gandhi, for discussing this. Uh, but now we would like to open up our discussion to all the participants. So if you have a question, you can use the chat or you can also raise your hand so we can call on you. I'll go ahead, Stephanie. Um, what advice would you give to people like who are looking to do research like in the field that you are? Okay, say that again, that that would do research. Say, okay, say that again. Sorry. Um, what, what advice would you give to like high schoolers or like young people about doing research? Yes. You know what I would advise is that, um, and you know, I didn't do this in high school and I wish I had. Anyone that works at a university that you're interested in working with them, just email them, just email them out of the blue. Um, and um, in your local town or any anyone that you find inspiring or that you like what they're working on and it's in your city or in your, in your town, write them and see what you can do. See if you can volunteer on um, over the summer, see if they have a project that, uh, that you could work on, you know, um, even, you know, from your computer or, or, or putting together figures or something for a paper. I have had many high school students do that. And I have worked with a number of high school students over the, um, the years. And it's always been actually someone just literally wrote me out of the blue who was in eighth grade um, in Seattle, Washington. And she was doing uh, a podcast for her school. And I ended up going on Zoom with her and we did a podcast um, on COVID-19 and, and her efforts in the city just at eighth grade of like, um, of helping with the homeless in the city, getting COVID-19 testing, for example. And never be afraid of just emailing people. And what I mean by that is especially academics, um, and people in departments of public health are really interested in working with, with young students and uh, really inspired by working with trainees. And I, again, I don't think there's anything that's more satisfying to me than working with trainees from the beginning all the way to infectious disease fellowship. Like that is the favorite part of my job. I get like many emails in a day. And when I look down the list, and I see them from my mentees or my trainees. I'm like, I'm going to do that first. I'm going to, I'm going to write back to those guys first because this is this is very. Anyone who's gone into academia is interested in training and interested in working with young people. So email people. Um, I actually have a personal question. Um. What were some concerns you had before committing to medicine or even when you were in the medical school? You know, um, I, uh, it, it was, a, um, you know, I, I personally actually was more interested in humanities and it just wasn't like my parents' goal for me. And it really, uh, my parents had gone through partition uh, of India and Pakistan in 1947 and it was just, they really, they really did kind of make the three of us and all three of us are doctors in my family go into medical school. And so I have to say it wasn't exactly like a chosen field. On the other hand, when I got into it, um, I loved it. And I started MD PhD and I ended up dropping the PhD because I just wanted to do medicine. It is singularly the field, I think, when you can go from a personal interaction where you have like an interaction with a patient that is so profoundly satisfying one-on-one -on -one, to where you can actually work on huge level policy implications from an MD. Uh, you, you can do both of those in one day. Um, there's also a lot of hierarchy in the global health setting. And I've done a lot of global health work in India. And frankly, having an MD um, and having that credentials of an MD gets you you, you get a lot of 
um, in these hierarchical places, you get uh, the ability to make change, having an MD. And uh, I have never regretted it since my parents made me go into medicine. <laughs> I have never regretted it and I've loved it. Um, it is a lot of work. And um, when you say regrets or, I mean, it isn't something that, uh, it becomes a vocation and not a career. Like, especially in academia, it genuinely just is not an eight to five thing. And it is, becomes like, a passion and it bleeds into your nighttime and it bleeds into your weekends and it's like it isn't that kind of career where um where it's circumscribed and so I think you do have to have an interest in it but I will definitely say to you that especially uh I can I can genuinely say that the things I do on a day-to-day -day basis have never like hurt the world and hopefully they've helped the world. And like, there's not every profession that you can say that where there's just kind of nothing you're doing that doesn't in some way help. Uh, and I, I, I can't actually think of another profession except for medicine where, um, where you can come home and know that. So um, anyone who's, again, anyone who's interested in medicine on this call, I am uh, really happy to stay in touch with you really happy to to answer things as you go along um it is it is i can't imagine my life any other way but being a doctor uh, so we have another question from the chat so someone asked how has COVID 19 affected your work as an infectious disease specialist you know the thing that i think has been the hardest for me actually is how busy I've become because um, one, the one thing about infectious disease doctors is that they don't actually have any procedures. We don't bronk people, we don't do cardiac catheterizations, we don't, we don't are not a procedure specialty. We're, we're what we call a cognitive specialty. And our superpower is being super detail oriented. That's what, that's the characteristic of an infectious disease doctor. And I have decided along with many ID people to um, become kind of a, to provide public messaging, to provide information to the public. And uh, I've never been on Twitter before. I don't like social media, I don't get it. But I started on Twitter on April, 2020 um, to learn about COVID, to like get the latest, things I wasn't getting the literature because things moved so fast in COVID. And then I started publicly messaging, like talking to people about vaccines or putting out data about vaccines. And um, I actually, I think it's really satisfying. I've gotten a lot of people writing me the saying, this is really optimistic. And now you've helped me understand how vaccines work. And on the other hand, it is totally taken like at least two hours out of my day. Um, where I was already really busy enough. And so um, it has been kind of a personal sacrifice, meaning I cannot wait till the COVID-19 pandemic's over so I can get off of Twitter and um, not do any more public messaging. Because to be honest, um, it's really exhausting. And I think what's been tiring is how nonstop COVID is. It's like every day there's new information. Every day there's something else to process. Every day there's like a new paper that you should put together. And so... Um, it's been incredibly exciting in a way to be an ID doctor during COVID and it's also been really exhausting. And because HIV is my first love and HIV is still happening, um, I'm looking forward to getting back to HIV once we get everyone vaccinated and get through the COVID-19 pandemic. So another question um, that Joyce just received, so she's gonna moderate this one. Say that again, what'd you say? I'm so sorry, um, Joyce just received one more question, so she's gonna say that out loud right now. Okay, great. Um, Nicole would like to know, um, what are some other jobs that are similar or related to what you do, or have you ever considered working in any other type of research? So I think that this is a really good question because I have thought about, if you don't want to go through four years of medical school, three years of residency, and three years of fellowship, um, what are other careers that are akin to being an infectious disease doctor, but also allow, you know, maybe less training? And I actually think that COVID-19 will transform public health. Um, and 
I think that never again will public health be, um, we were gonna make major changes in our country in, in, in kind of having a public health core. And I think getting a master's in public health is a very meaningful career uh, after undergraduate because um, after COVID-19, uh, everything's going to change about public health. I also think that PharmD, which is a very interesting profession, getting a pharmacist degree, um, I'm pretty amazed because I've worked really closely with pharmacists about how much they can do and how much they inform the dialogue about uh, antiretroviral therapy, COVID-19 therapeutics. And um, I would not, I, I, I think I would also be really interested if I were to do this all over again about the concept of being a pharmacist or being a master's in public health. Um, epidemiology is different. Epidemiology is uh, anywhere ranging from getting an MPH to a PhD in epidemiology, or you can be an MD like myself, but get an MPH and, and have training in epidemiology. But it does not require an infectious disease to be a doctor to be an epidemiologist, obviously. And I do think that the PhD epidemiologists have really contributed to the conversation. So I am, I, I, I there are many ways to get to this, to get to a very meaningful career. And it does not have to be, not all of you on this call have to become an infectious disease doctor. <laughs> So um, you are an extremely successful physician and you are very, very decorated, Dr. Gandhi. Um, what aspects of your life have helped you get to this point? Um, I do think that, um, and I actually give a talk on this on time management, um, that you have to be, as you grow up um, in your career, you have to let go of some key things. And what I mean by that is you have to let go of being perfect and everything. You have to let go of perfect being the enemy of the good. You have to decide where you want to be super detail oriented and do your best and where things don't need to be perfect and where you can just, you know, just turn in that report and it doesn't, it doesn't, you don't need to anguish over it. And I do think that this is a, something that you have to learn, one has to learn over time, um, especially if you're really motivated is to let go of that idea that everything has to be done a certain way and and allow some things to not be done as well so that you can concentrate on things that are important that you have to do well. The second concept of time management is um, is is prioritizing and turning off your email or turning off distractions. I genuinely actually hate social media. I gen genuinely hate it. I think it is it is probably one of the biggest wastes of time that I could think of. Um, and it gets really like consuming and then you can go here and there and there. And I, I, I as soon as I can be off Twitter, the better. But um, because I think that there's something to be said for just time management means turning off distractions and being as productive as you can in the moment. And so if you're a late night person, do your best work at night. If you're an early morning person, don't turn on your email until you've written that abstract, until you've written that, what you need to do for school. Like do that first. And then as your reward, turn on your email or look at social media. So be think about ways to manage your time where you respect the time with yourself and you respect your own personal creativity and where, you're, where you do your best work and honor that time and turn off everything else. And, and so it is a matter of, and I know how you guys have grown up because I, I have two children and I'm watching um, how much media comes into their play and how much technology comes into a play and devices come into. And that's not how I grew up, but, um, and we stop, uh, like what I mean is I have an 11 and 13 year old uh, sons and on the weekends, I actually literally turn off my phone. I don't, I don't even want to look at it. I, I, I turn it off. There's ways for my parents to get a hold of me and I bury it deep in my purse and I am like massively present with them and they are massively present with me. And, um, and uh, when I'm like with a friend, I put my phone down and I put it backwards so I can't see it and I turn it off, you know, I, I can make sure that there's nothing emergently happen, but it's a matter of being present. And um, I te actually teach this in one of our mentoring courses. And I think that is what has helped me be um, focused and, and work um, productively in the time that I have. 
very, very important advice for all of us. Um, I've gotten a question in the chat and I know you've just um, given us a lot of advice, um, but this question is asking what you did in high school to prep for the medical field and what we should do to prep specifically for medical school. You know, what I did is um, I, I was one of those EP class kids. So I did take a lot of AP classes. And then I actually um, ended up in my senior year of high school taking college courses at the local college, which was University of Utah. So um, I do, um, I really do believe in the AP program. I think it's, uh, I, th I think it's pretty massively important to kind of test out of some of these college things so that in college I could concentrate on the things I wanted to take. And then in addition, because I was, um, you know, I mean, sure, my parents wanted me to do medicine, but I did volunteer at a hospital in high school. And at the time it was called candy striping. Um, but I think it probably won't use, we don't, we don't use this terminology anymore. But when I told you that high school um, students email me and they come and follow me in clinic, I have clinic every Thursday and they literally come and or oh, during COVID they've been wearing masks and distancing from the patients and we and they come on Thursdays and we and see what a clinic is like like shadow see who you can figure out in your area who's a doctor who's going to let you shadow them and it's really meaningful and then ask if you can have time with the patients alone so what I do is I always ask them okay um, you know, I'm going to leave the room because I have to go and like do something down the hall, spend some time with this patient. And in this case, because I only treat HIV, um, the, the student will ask them, like, tell me about when you first got HIV. Tell me what that felt like. Tell me, you know, what you were doing. Tell me the day that it happened and explain to me what that felt like and who influenced you um, going forth with the diagnosis. So take that ability of your narrative because you may not know a lot about medicine obviously but like you are um someone who's interested in medicine and just talk to that patient it is amazing how much you can learn from just sitting and talking with another human being so i would encourage you to just write like with your friends parents whatever it is like find a doctor whom you admire that you like and follow them yeah, that's great advice, Dr. Ghani. I'll definitely try to implement that in my future. But uh, we have one final question, and it is, what is something that you had wish you'd done differently in your career that you've learned from? You know, um, I do think that you have to focus. And what I mean by that is, um, especially the people on this call are probably really interested in like a lot of things. And you have to actually realize that even at your age and even at your stage, you have to say no to things that are um, take you in a totally different direction. Have focus about what you're interested in and stay with that and don't take this course or don't do this that it doesn't get you on the path. I actually am really interested in literature, for example, but I did that as a as on my own time, but I didn't, um, I was really pretty focused in college and medical school. And it's this idea that you can't actually expand time. Um, and like performance artists have figured this out. Like we think we can do a lot, we cannot expand time. And so use it meaningfully. And again, I just don't think some things are like meaningful, like social media and stuff. So, so figure out where like that's just for fun, but then keep focused. That's great. Um, that will be all the questions we are taking today. And thank you so much, Dr. Gandhi. For great to talk to all of you. Stay in touch with me. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to chat with us. Um, all of our participants, you can give your thank yous or chat, or you can use the clap emoji reaction. <laughs> <laughs> you can turn on the, your cameras and say hello. Thank you all. Really, I'm quite serious. My email is open to you. It's, I'm going to put it in the put it here, but you are all welcome to, to write me anytime. And I am impressed with this group of motivated individuals and I'm happy to talk to you. Thank you. Thank so you. Much,